All right. So thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, today for the deep dive on smart agri-food. Um, now, before we start, I uh, just quick and before I introduce you to our moderator, I just quickly want to uh, briefly welcome our media partners, Business Reporter, uh, Cities Forum, um, Compass List, Our Future Water, Renewable Matter, uh, Smart Cities World, and Zoom Global Cities. And uh, now I would like to introduce you uh, to our moderator for today. Um, here, just a quick overview of the agenda. But um, quickly introduce you to our moderator. Our moderator is uh, Andrea Cruciani. Andrea is the Agricolist co-founder and CEO, and he is a member of the Fire Foundation BOD. Uh, he's the chairman of the Fire Smarty Agri-Food Mission Support Committee, and he runs the international business area and the financial aspects of the companies he works for. And he also has a technical background and experience in applications, development, enterprise architecture, cloud computing, and GIS. So Andrea, the stage is yours. Thank you, Charlotte. And uh, uh, it's a, a real pleasure to be here with you today because uh, we have today the chance to discuss a bit about uh, uh, this topic that is uh, quite uh, popular, that is the thumb to fork uh, uh, movement. Now we are discussing a lot of uh, uh, this approach that uh, keeps together the production and the consumer. But uh, so far we have uh, discussed a lot about these things uh, without going too deep in technology. Thanks to Fiverr, we have an enabler that helps us to create this ecosystem and to create a real connection between different systems. And our idea today is to go deep with some interesting sessions, the keynote speakers and the real user stories to understand how Fiverr can enable a real world scenario for farm to fork. And now I'm uh, glad to, uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Julian Lampietti. He is uh, the manager for global engagement in agriculture and food global practice uh, in the uh, World Bank. And uh, he uh, will give us uh, an idea of uh, uh, the future of this sector from his perspective. And uh, thanks uh, to Dr. Giulia Lampietti, the floor is you. Thank you so much, Andrea and Charlotte. Uh, so I'm Julian Lampietti, and I've been at the bank for uh, about 250 years or so. And um, I, uh, I uh, have covered Middle East, North Africa, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Latin America, and Africa over the course of my career, as well as lived in Thailand and a number of other places, uh, Argentina included. And uh, the title of my talk today is What's Cooking? Rethinking Food and Farm Policy in the Digital Age. Uh, I'm going to give you lots of examples of cattle farming today because I am on the weekends a cattle farmer. I manage a small farm and it's not because I believe in feedlots and or eat lots of red meat, but because I love farming and I love the idea of stewardship of the land. What I'm not going to talk about today is uh, the billions and billions of dollars that the World Bank puts into the agriculture sector and how it responds to the coronavirus. And I'm also, uh, I just want to uh, tell you at the front here that I'm not a sailor, but I'm going to use lots of nautical terms in my presentation. What I want to do is leave you with three key ideas about how we can change our food system. And those ideas are that we can use digital technology to deconcentrate markets, decentralize traceability, and disseminate data. Now, the pandemic has shown a very, very bright light on what's wrong with our food system. And the most striking images of that are, on the one hand, uh, at a certain point when the pandemic started, we would go to grocery stores and there wouldn't be enough food on the shelves. And this is still the case in many countries in the world where there's actually uh, very acute local food shortages. Uh, at the same time, 
we heard stories about farmers uh, dumping milk in the field, smashing eggs and plowing under their vegetables because they couldn't sell them. And, it, you know, this sort of uh, throwing away of food and having a shortage of food, it, overabundance on the one hand and scarcity on the other is a sort of symptom of how our system is broken. It's also a symptom of the pervasive uh, information asymmetries and transaction costs that run across our food system. So at the heart of the system are 570 million farmers, most of them quite small, and 7.7 .7 billion consumers. And the idea is how do you use technology, particularly digital technology, to connect these two groups in ways that don't destroy the planet and feed everyone and allow people to have a good life. And I'm gonna argue that um, digital technology accompanied by the right public policies is one way to move toward a more uh, resilient, inclusive and sustainable model in our food system. Now, don't get me wrong. There is no doubt that our food system has done an amazing job at feeding people. Since 1960, cereal production has almost tripled, significantly outpacing the rate of population growth. But the weaknesses in the system are becoming increasingly obvious as we push the planetary boundaries. And the digital technology revolution offers the possibility of an alternative equilibrium to huge farms, uh, you know, that sort of concentrate all the power in the world. And the the uh, the idea is that you know can we use digital technology to have small scale flexible organizational systems that produce food and nimbly uh, navigate a changing environment? And um, let me give you a, an, an image to think of. Everyone's probably heard of the Battle of Dunkirk, and the British uh, were up against the coastline, surrounded by the Germans. And uh, they had to evacuate Dunkirk. And they had all these big ships that were docked uh, there in Dunkirk. And they were just getting systematically bombed uh, by, the, uh, by the enemy air force. Now, uh, they solved this problem by enlisting thousands of small boats and sending them across the uh, sea and bringing them back. And uh, so they have this like really decentralized small scale approach to solving the, the problem of evacuating the soldiers. And you know, that kind of flexible solution is what I want to advocate for when it comes to our food system. So despite providing food uh, for a world population that has more than doubled in the last 50 years, we're way off course in terms of achieving the sustainable development goals related to hunger, poverty, health, land use, and climate change. Since 2014, the number of undernourished people has been rising. One in five children under the age of five is stunted. Two billion people are overweight or obese. And agriculture contributes around 25% of greenhouse gas emissions, consumes 70% of fresh water, and is uh, the leading cause of loss of vertebrate biodiversity since the 1970s. Uh, uh, the Food and Land Use Coalition has calculated that the cost of the negative externalities of our food system is around $12 trillion uh, per year, outweighing a market value of 10 trillion. So we're eating into our future. Now, there's also an additional 120 million people that are under threat of poverty because of this pandemic. And, and the pandemic is shrinking their incomes and their ability to uh, not only access, but also buy food. Um, the World Food Program came out uh, last year and said that we're facing a famine of biblical proportions. Now, that may be an exaggeration, but there's no doubt that the number of hungry people is going up very quickly in this world, despite all of the abundance that we have. So how do we set a new course for our food system? A course that delivers healthy people, a healthy economy, and a healthy planet. So think of the food system like a, a, a dinghy or a boat. 
And we keep putting additional pieces of cargo into this boat, and it's becoming tippier and tippier. So you have population growth, climate change, loss of biodiversity, pollution. And each time you add one of these things, the boat becomes more and more unstable. Now, we have the coronavirus pandemic, the latest thing that's hit us. And the boat is wobbling. But the solution is not to deal with the thing that is, uh, you know, at the margin tipping the boat, because it could be a small thing. You have to reevaluate the whole contents of the boat and think about how to reorganize them in a way that makes the whole boat more stable. And Mother Nature is amazingly resilient. And combined with human ingenuity, we will be able to overcome this current crisis. And digital technologies and networks can really help us address longstanding market failures. So why is digital different than previous agricultural revolutions? The digital is different because it started off the farm and then has moved to all the different points of our food system. You think about the British agricultural revolution, which was the, um, the advent of the cast iron plow or the green revolution where people used uh, seed and fertilizer packages uh, to increase yields. Those uh, revolutions promoted on-farm productivity. And that's where they started, and then they put more food into the system. Digital started, you know, in Amazon and all sorts of other places, uh, and is affecting all the different parts of the system, and then moving to the farm. And the farm is actually a latecomer to this uh, process. And digital technology drives change on multiple fronts at accelerated rates by collecting, using, and analyzing massive amounts of machine-readable data in practically every aspect of the food system, and it does so at zero marginal cost. So once you build it, it's there. And what we're seeing is we're seeing venture capitalists pour billions and billions of dollars into ag startup all over the world. And we're seeing the traditional large agricultural companies playing catch up with e-commerce, telecom, IBM, Google, and many others. And uh, you know, these large companies that have traditionally dominated the food system are only now just realizing that it's all about the data. Now, my point is that the digital innovation is only as good as its purpose. And to yield public, um, to yield positive outcomes, public policy must boost complementarity in infrastructure and human capacity, address disparities in access to supply chains, and also allow producers to earn a just wage and pay close attention to environmental benefits. So I'm going to focus on three recommendations. Public policy should deconcentrate markets and supply chains, decentralize traceability, and disseminate data. So let me talk about deconcentration. What we're seeing uh, globally is that markets are becoming increasingly concentrated and that concentration takes many shapes and forms from physical markets to virtual markets. But these are particularly perilous in times of crisis. Think about the Titanic, you know, the most luxurious state of the art passenger ship when she set sail on her maiden voyage. Everyone thought she was too big to sink, but we all know how that ended. So if you think about the US uh, retail food sector, for example, uh, take the, the beef sector. What we're seeing is the entire thing is starting to be concentrated in a, a few slaughterhouses. And there's a small disruption in those slaughterhouses. And then there's huge problems in terms of people accessing meat uh, across the country. Now, if we continue to concentrate, those shocks to the supply chains are going to get a lot worse. And Digital technologies can provide a beacon of hope uh, to these stories of supply chain breakdown. You think about um, how markets work and uh, the idea that uh, traditional farmers markets are places where people sell and transact food. And they provide uh, physical platforms where consumers and producers can interact. So how do you scale that up so that people all over the place can access these markets without becoming concentrated, but trade with each other on a more bilateral basis. 
uh, some really interesting examples of this in uh, Argentina, where I used to live, where it used to be that everyone would have to take their animals to a single place and they would have an auction. And then so the animal would come from their farm, go in the auction and then go back to another farm or a feedlot or a slaughterhouse or wherever it happened to be. And those uh, points of concentration led to lots of suffering by the animals, disease transmission and high transaction costs. And now the biggest animal exchanges in Argentina have become completely virtual. So people have cameras on their farm and uh, the traders sit at desks behind their computers and uh, the auction takes place virtually. You buy your animal on farm X and you transport it directly to farm Y and it leads to a lot less cost and much less suffering and disease transmission around the uh, animals. And so the role of public policy and organizations like the bank and uh, governments is really to think through how to create these digital platforms to avoid concentration and allow people to trade consumers and producers in a way where they capture a greater share of the value of these transactions. Now, the second point I want to make is on decentralizing traceability. So. Right now, uh, tracing food throughout the supply chain system in a decentralized manner can create huge opportunities for safer, more sustainable food. Knowing where your food comes from and how it was produced allows consumers to make more informed decisions about the impact of food they consume on their health and on the planet's health. So, and more sustainably produced food um, earns a price uh, that can reward the people that engage in that kind of behavior. Uh, so uh, I want to give you an example from Uruguay, where beef exports rose 700% uh, between 2001 and 2018. And that's partly because uh, the government of Uruguay had the foresight to realize that foot and mouth disease was a huge problem when they got hit with it in 2000. And what they did is they created an open digital system where every farmer could register their cow and track it. And so this was sort of a uh, completely free open system. Farmers would enter their data and then everyone who was transacting around those animals had much better information about what was going on and disease. And that tremendously increased competition at different nodes of the supply chain. It also, uh, increased resilience to fraud and uh, to falsifying information. And the kinds of ideas of uh, open access traceability are huge opportunities to reward uh, the producers of the food uh, for their, the activities they're engaging in. The third idea I want to put forward is uh, the importance of disseminating open data. We've all heard it before, you know, data is the new oil. And, uh, you know, just think of the impact of releasing the gen genetic sequence of the coronavirus. That led to almost instantaneously 150 different uh, companies starting to try to produce vaccines, both in the public and private sector. and. Uh, you know, you have such a complex food system, and if you want to uh, create competition at the every level of that system, uh, the more open data you can put out there, the easier it is to correct what we call uh, information asymmetries. You can also encourage innovation, and you can dramatically increase the efficiency of public spending. So, if, for example, in Kenya, they promoted an open the Kenya Open Data Initiative. And so the government put core development, demographic, statistical, and expenditure data and made it online and made it available in a useful digital format to anyone who wanted it. So this led to a huge innovation culture in Kenya, uh, particularly in the agri-food space. Uh, I also want to highlight that today the world spends about $700 billion a year in support of the agriculture. And when I say the world, it's the governments of the world that are spending this money. Now, uh, digital data on what's going on with agriculture, on soils, on animals, on forests, on everything related to agriculture, weather, 
can really increase the way the efficiency of how we spend uh, this money. And um, I'll just give you one small example. So on my farm, I get payments from the U.S. government to uh, to grow my grass a certain height because that enables uh, less erosion and increased uh, carbon sequestration in the soil. And so that would be a really good use of public money. A bad use would be subsidizing fertilizer, which would then lead me to produce more grass and more cattle and erosion in the rivers and less soil carbon. So digital data uh, can really improve uh, the efficiency of markets and is a tremendous uh, public good. Now, I also want to say that um, data is private and we have to respect those rules and we really need to think through how governments do this in a way that does not uh, give certain people or certain companies uh, advantages that are not accorded to others. So the pandemic hit us in early 2020. And the food system was already due for a major course correction. Now is the time for us to really rethink how we produce our food and engage in a change that will allow us to survive while also not destroying our planetary boundaries. Digital technologies are a fantastic way to do this. As long as we think about the goals of using these technologies to achieve sustainable development and as long as we think about deconcentration, decentralization, and dissemination of open data. So please join me and let's figure out how to be creative in this space, innovate, and connect the 570 million farmers with the 7.7 .7 billion consumers and make a more sustainable food system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lampiet. It's uh, clear and uh, very uh, powerful vision that you suggested to us today. And uh, we feel that uh, we are aligned with the, our approach in FIWARE. We want to connect all the uh, innovators in the sector, thanks to FIWARE technologies, and to create a more uh, organic and uh, distributed system that can support both producers and consumers but also public government and all the stakeholders thank you very much and uh, if you can stay uh, with us a bit uh, you will see that uh, we have already some uh, uh, success stories about this uh, but uh, we hope that we will have uh, again the opportunity to discuss with you about the vision uh, that uh, i see that is very similar uh, between us and you thank you and now we move to uh, our uh, first uh, uh, session on uh, uh, fiber uh, technology and how it has been used in a specific uh, sector. Uh, we will discuss with uh, Dr. Frank Legal, uh, that is the CEO of EGM, an innovative SME, focused on integration and validation of emerging technologies. Thank you, uh, Dr. Legal, to be with us. Uh, today, you will discuss uh, with us about uh, digitalization uh, for agroecology. What's agroecology? Okay, Sorry thank you. Yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I hope you can hear me fine and that you can see the, the screen sharing. Uh, also, I just created yeah. a quick poll uh, in the chat in case you want to, to answer it and to, to have also some actions on, on, uh, on your side for, for all attendees. Um, what I'm going to present is uh, what uh, we are doing uh, on digitalization for agroecology. And maybe to start with, uh, I have to, to explain a bit what is agroecology. Um, so it's something which started quite some, a long time ago in the, in the 60s and which initially built on three main uh, principles for conservation agriculture. agriculture being first a minimal, minimum mechanical soil disturbance, which means no tillage, uh, so direct seeding on, 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 the, on the soil without disturbance. Um, 
maintaining a permanent soil organic cover, uh, which is really important. So it's what we we call um, carbon feeding of, of the soil because it allows really the, the soil to to, to 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 life, and so we avoid any empty soils. And uh, going for species diversification. So it's not always the same culture, but going for with uh, altern um, alternating cultures and uh, mixing different cultures whenever possible. And uh, to go with some images, uh, so it can adapt uh, for many different uh, productions. Uh, so for, for field crops, for example, so always no-till. Uh, we go with high carbon density crops and again, maintaining the, the permanent cover crops. And here you have a, a quite good image here, uh, five meter tools here you, 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 you see. Um, in France, so it was quite uh, quite good simply with going with agroecology. Maybe to be precise, agroecology doesn't mean that there is no use of chemical fertilizers, but simply that it's not the main focus. So it's not, they are not bringing any chemical fertilizer if it's not absolutely uh, needed, but it's not measured in the same way uh, as usual. So all of this is more natural and made simply because you, you, you maintain this soil uh, living. The same can be applied with vegetables, so still no tills, using the mulching and tarps to maintain the, the soil cover all around, and uh, these uh, regenerate the soil with uh, by providing carbon to, to the soil. So it's really about providing carbon back to the soil. From fruit, the same, so always the same principles, covered soil and uh, the mixing of uh, the fruits uh, productions with uh, with some permanent flowers uh, production, uh, obviously for all insects and so on, it's much better ecosystem. So it's it's really uh, mixing things together, and these then apply to 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 many productions. If you look at the aquaculture, for example, you may have heard about IMTA, which is integrated multitrophic aquaculture, where you are mixing algae fishes, shells, and so on. So you, you create, again, the same ecosystem. So all of these uh, can belong to, to, to the agroecology principles. Um, and this is, is really taking place uh, at the worldwide level. And uh, if uh, you look, even the FAO is looking at this. Uh, they have identified 10 elements of agroecology uh, to, to, to provide some guidance to go for sustainable foods and uh, agriculture system. And beyond the three principles I was uh, mentioning uh, before, so enhancing the ecosystem, managing the biodiversity, then you have also to think in agroecology about all recycling efficiency and what has been seen that you, you need to really involve uh, farmers, uh, local farmers, so to, to build um, uh, production models locally by exchanging uh, on, on, on the same commons. And for that, we need new sensory information. I mean, we are not measuring uh, usual uh, nutrients like nitrogen uh, as doing before. So, so the nitrogen cycle, okay, it's here, but it's not the, the main driver. Um, for, for we, we, when you are driving the agro agroecology uh, principles. You need to, to share knowledge with farmers or within the local community. So doing some participatory research because it works by observation. Okay, It acknowledges the fact that the system, the soil system is much more complicated than simply a nitrogen cycle. And um, there are some unknowns and only by observation you can go and understand it. And this is why they are pushing for uh, user-driven uh, innovation processes and sharing these uh, innovation, this knowledge across across them. So at the end, create the, the circular and the solidarity economy. If I go back to the technology data spaces um, we are speaking about, um, we can think also about the agroecology data space. So it's okay, like let's say the usual. Uh, farming principles, obviously, we have some soil, we have some equipment, we have to deal with weather, and at the end, we're interested by the, the farm management system to, 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 to manage the farm, so to, to feed the full life cycle. But what is important as well to add is considering the environment, considering other aspects in, in the soil, looking at all the community around so it doesn't it's not, not only the farm you have to, to look at the whole territory to discuss with policymakers and so on and obviously with uh, your uh, your colleagues your farmers around you 
And for that, you need that platform, which is able to deal with multi-format data, new sensor information, able to do some community sharing, provide decision support, and this at multi-scale over multiple domains. Uh, speaking about multiple domains, uh, it's important to mention this kind of initiative as well, which are not that far that you may have heard about, for example, which is the uh, water energy food nexus, where you say, okay, if I want to produce food, obviously I need some energy, I need to consume some waters, and I have exchanges in all of these dimensions. And for that, uh, there are some actions where you have to, to exchange data, so to build models for, uh, for, for that nexus. Luckily, we have uh, this uh, specification, these standards and GSILD from, uh, from Etsy, which is uh, on, the, on the basis for all fiber offer and where we are uh, providing um, or we allow uh, to, to manage context information. So any piece of information is contextualized in time, space, and relation to, to other data. And this is really useful to manage uh, aspects like the one I was mentioning. And having these cross-domain capabilities allows that with a simple model, simple API, we are able to tackle these different domains. Another important aspect, you know, we have these brokers in the middle exchanging information and uh, we are able to go with a centralized federated architecture, which means that we have can have on the territory level, on the farm level, we can have different brokers systems exchanging information together. And this allows to not only consider the farm, but really consider the whole ecosystem of our territory. I was thinking about new sensor information. Um, What's important to, to mention that agroecology acknowledge that systems are complex. We don't know everything. Multiphysics is not enough to explain what's happening in, in the soil. One minute uh, to okay. the end. And we have to rely on, on ground-based mass observations. So meaning uh, tens, hundreds of farmers doing observations, providing feedbacks. And to deal with this kind of information, then we have to include uh, deep learning approaches, machine learning approaches, where we call from very field observations, deploy new models in the fireware infrastructure using uh, technologies like model as a service, and to provide at the end decision support to the farm. Main work ahead uh, on this, all data exchange principles are known. But we have to work on the data model, specific data model for agroecology, connecting the existing models, analyzing relations with other domains, and complete with different aspects like environmental, economical, social ecosystem integration. We always want to build our standardized and open source solutions. It's community based, so this is really mandatory and important. And uh, still, we need to be based on actual use cases. So it has to, to come from the field. Uh, bottom up uh, to provide the solution. I uh, thank you for your time, and maybe we'll have time for questions afterward. Yeah, let's hope that we'll have time for questions because it's very interesting. Even this uh, uh, session, this part of the uh, agriculture that is more on sustainability. And uh, another topic that is very important to us is traceability. And now we call uh, to speak uh, Dr. Sabine Kalazer. I hope that I told this in the right way. Uh, Senior Manager Identification Plus Data Carrier from uh, GSM1 uh, Germany. Uh, thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, and thank you Boris very much. Yours. Thank you very much for um, for giving the um, introduction for this kind of introduction, and also thank you very much to Fireware for inviting me to show what GS1 and the GS1 standards offer to the every food domain, and also on the interoperability potential between Fireware. Just let me see. I try to to select. The Okay, now I try to again <laughs> to show the screen. So it will take some minutes, uh, some seconds, just a moment. But I think I, I can already start. Um, well, do you see the screen now? Yes, now we we'll oh, see it. Great. Okay, so as you can imagine, I can um, today only tease the topic at this point, and this is why I will focus on a very brief introduction on GS1 standards, and then I will show you the outcomes of the IOF 2020 project from our perspective 
since this is very good covers this very good covers in a nutshell the potential of GS1 standards in the agri food domain. Okay, so then let us start with the introduction. So GS1 is neutral and a not-for-profit organization. Also, we are user-driven. We develop our standards together with our users. And even if we wanted to, we cannot do so without their mission. And we need their agreement on any standards changes. So, and we work global and local. So I am with GS1 Germany. And there are 150 member organizations all around the globe just like GS1 Germany and with the global office in Brussels. And six billion barcodes are scanned every day. This is what we are very often associated with, the EAN UPC code carrying the GTIN number in it and scanned at point of sale. But our capacity goes far beyond and we are not restricted to any industry. From technology perspective, GS1 standards are best explained as a triad. First, we enable to uniquely identify products, services, assets, objects of all kinds, but also companies and digital or physical locations. This can be a product type, a product with a batch number, a company or a part of a company like a plot. To easily capture these IDs, we standardize data capture technologies like barcodes and the data elements and formats. For example, we define data elements for best before date, a harvesting date, but also for country of production. So on everything that is needed for cross company communication. And last but not least, we standardize data sharing technologies. Most important with regard to traceability and transparency is the data sharing and interface standard EPCIS, since it enables every relevant event inside a company and across companies to be captured, answering the questions, <clears throat> what happened, where and when did it happen, and what was the reason it happened. This will enable information retrieval on the history of an object, be it a product, an asset, or a location, like a production line. A typical query might be, where did the raw material of a product come from? When was it harvested? Or in what production line has a product been finished? On the right, you see a holistic view of a typical supply chain with different production steps. It shows how business needs are covered with the right mix of our technologies. <clears throat> this can be a typical business step like production or packing. And you will also find a link on the current GS1 traceability standards and industry guidelines based on it, like the fresh food and vegetable traceability guideline. Now let's dig into the outcome of IOF 2020. For those who are not aware of the project, IOF 2020 stands for the European Research Project Internet of Food and Farm 2020, and it explored the potential of IoT technologies for the European food and farming industry. It just finished in April of this year. You see all our success stories here, but again, we will focus on only some of them, starting with the smart tray. This use case on intelligent food logistics was led by Europol Systems and it focused on the very well known folding tray you see in the light in the left side of the tray. The idea of the use case was to pay more attention on how harvested crops travel from farm to fork and how their quality is affected. And this is done by analyzing what happens with the box as it travels through the supply chain. Therefore, the trays were equipped with an IoT device, and thus complex supply chains could be analyzed. And here the application could build on the unique identification of every box. This is the global returnable asset identifier you see printed on every label on every box. And this could al already be used in the use case um, to identify every single box. Also crucial for the use case was the actual location of the box. And here the GLN was of help. 
since the supply chain partners already have their unique GLN, and this could be combined with the physical location the boxes were at a certain time. So the GLN is the identification of a company or a location in the world of GS1. On top of this, we took the opportunity and tested at an early stage the GS1 digital link with the resolver service um, by means of this smart tray. Now, what is the digital link? It enables a single code to perform multiple functions. Here it can be the ID of the box, scanned, for example, in logistic applications or during a cleaning process, carrying the gray, as I explained earlier. But it is also used to give information in the web. We tested our resolver service that enables redirection to the information of the internet on returnable assets as a general, or it could also be a string explaining um, redirection for um, more detailed information like sustainability information or giving a link or giving um, information, for example, on the latest cleaning event. So the string of data carrying the gray is turned into a web address and in the request, the link type is added to allow for providing such information. So this is a good example on how we bridge the gap from physical to the digital world. Let's move to the next topic, that is proactive auditing. Here, the major partners from industry were the huge Dutch Farmers Association, focuses, focusing on sustainable pork that own their own auditing scheme, an auditor and also a slaughterhouse, respectively a meat processor. Until now, auditing traditionally happened only once a year. By using proactive auditing, this can happen anytime and in a proactive manner. Thus, the focus is on providing feedback to the farmer and avoiding mistakes instead of sanctions after problems have already occurred. Therefore, we developed an event model for pig farming and the concept of using EPCIS for proactive auditing. In this concept, this is done by using EPCIS as one single source of information for the auditors. So every information needed for the audit is captured as an event, EPCIS event, like a veterinarian inspection or the minimum weaning age of a piglet. This can be monitored in real time and the auditing company can give feedback soon enough to keep the performance of the farmer high and to, so, to support him to meet the criteria. So the newsworthiness from our side was on the one hand using EPCIS for audits, but on the other hand to develop the event model for pig farming. By now, there was no use of fireware technology in this use case, but we wanted to show that users need not decide on one standard world or the other, but in general, there is a permeability between the two standard worlds. And this is why the OLIAD mediation gateway was developed. The programming was done by KAIS, the Korean Research Institute. Sorry, where, Yeah, thank you. Where OLIAD is the EPCIS compliant open source solution of KAIS. So what happened in detail? It is a cooperation with another meet trial of IOF 2020 that used the Orion context broker from Fireware for status data on pig behavior and climate condition in the pens. These data coming from Orion were partly transferred into EPCIS compliant data formats and populated in OLIA and in EPCAT, uh, where EPCAT is the EPCIS solution from our partner EECC. So we showed interoperability between Fireware and GS1. This was well achieved within the project and you will find documentation on GitHub it also has been added to the fireware catalog and can be a good starting point for further research on this subject. So that's actually everything from my side and thank you for listening. 
thank you thank you it's very interesting and uh, we are uh, going deep uh, in the farm to fork uh, 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 argument and uh, now it's time for uh, discussing about uh, agri-food data spaces and data models uh, with Harald, Dr. Harald Soundmaker, a senior researcher in the ATB Bremen. Uh, he is uh, uh, an expert uh, in the fiber since the beginning. Uh, he is one of the uh, vice-chairs of the Mission Support Committee uh, of Agri-Food in Fiber, and he is also a, a very good friend. Uh, floor is yours, Harald. Andrea, thank you very much for this very, very kind introduction. So my compliments back to you and thank you for your efforts for preparing that. So um, we would like to talk now about agri-food data spaces and data models. Also, my thanks goes to Juan Rogero, who's also working a lot uh, in this area and also contributing to this smart agri-food domain. <clears throat> and uh, therefore, I would like to remind us, and we talked a lot about this also in the last month and possibly even years, uh, that especially the system of systems approach and well, we see more and more smart solutions coming up uh, also in the agri-food domain. And here, for instance, also with the pictures, you see more an example from arable farming, but also there you see a lot of work in the last possibly even decades, uh, which took place and uh, was coming up now to quite a lot of uh, smart solutions and cre creating at the very end diverse data sources. So this means at the current moment, we have already a lot of data sources. And uh, when we are thinking on um, fireware and also the efforts which is going on now towards uh, digital twins, um, I think uh, the work in fireware is really facilitating access to such data especially when we are thinking that um, this digital twin representation is, let's say, representing the real world and that we know, yes, there we are really talking about a kind of context representation because at the very end of the day, what are we talking about? That uh, more or less digital twin, as you possibly also were already looking at in, in the most recent past, uh, it's talking about properties, about relationships, so also then linked data, values uh, of attributes. So, you know, m may change, as we just heard from Sabine, as she was talking about the event, the the object-related world and, and those perspectives. So very interesting how even to match, let's say, those perspectives. So, however, also when we're here, we're talking typically about locations and uh, at the very end, um, about, let's say, digital twins collection. Therefore, also giving here an explanation, I would say straightforward for agri-food. Yes, when talking about entities, what are we talking about? Possibly a tractor, a crop, a drone. So quite very normal uh, aspect. Therefore, well, uh, that's about the smart solutions and about, let's say, the available data. At the same time, uh, when we are now looking at the domain, well, uh, yes, we are talking nowadays a lot about sensing and monitoring, analysis and planning and smart control. Well, even at first hand, when we are, uh, let's say, using uh, the, our food as well as also shipping it in the chain. So at the first hand, we're talking about decision making. Um, and about business consumers. We're talking about food integrity. And more and more, we are opening up those dimensions. Um, it's also going beyond the borders of individual organization. As let's say also in the very introduction, the plenary, we were talking about really sharing data along the chain uh, for possibly even cross-sectorial purposes, as we can easily imagine that also concerning our health, or nutrition, environment, also such data originating in, in agri-food could be very interesting also for smart solutions. And at the very end, we're talking about science, technology. So uh, we're talking about diverse technologies, which are also nowadays work. So qu quite something going on. Therefore, we were also trying in the work now looking, so coming from smart solutions towards data space because well, we, we really want to, let's say, 
visualize also those steps saying, yes, we have smart agri-food solutions, offering data, integrating the system well, possibly at the farm, as a logistics provider along the chain, as you saw the Europool trays, which are traveling along the chain. There you, have, you can integrate systems with such a company. But at the very end, you can also share data. Well, of course, in the agri-food chain, uh, but as I said, even before, even with, uh, with other sectors outside that. This means smart solution, integrating the systems inside the organization, and at the very end, creating data spaces um, for exchanging and sharing data between companies. So, and each step has its own challenges and uh, its, its, its own, let's say, specifics. Therefore, how, how can we boil that down? And I think when we were talking about Fireware in the last years, again and again, yes, of course, it's about standard API um, for getting access to digital twin data and at the very end, also about common data models. And I would say also very practical data models, not too abstract, not just, not just the ontology, but really more and more towards, let's say, the developers to make use of. And we must not forget a lot of work was done in the past. So uh, our objective and the collaboration we're having here and the things we are discussing with the colleagues over the years, it's not just that we want to reinvent the wheel. Therefore, I was putting here a picture even about the collaboration of the AEF with the Air Gateway, how you can connect machines to the farm management information system. Uh, all, all, all there, like with the ADAPT standard, a lot was uh, done in, in the, let's say, last years or even decades on those standards, or like Sabine was presenting before on, on the EPCIS standards. So a lot of, let's say, body of knowledge is available. So, and we, we do not want to ignore that. Therefore, yes, we think from a, software perspective, from the functionality perspective, we are often talking about the context broker as, let's say, the baseline technology, of, let's say, or background and, and key enabler to uh, power solutions by Fireware. Therefore, yes, and possibly you already saw some reference architectures, and we think that is really uh, the, the starting point also to talk with different stakeholders at, so where, where shall we start at, at which, let's say, element uh, in this architecture, we, we can, let's say, uh, do the next steps where we are, what can we reuse? And when we're talking about reuse, definitely, I want to highlight in this presentation, it's about also data models and possibly, as you know, about the initiative also from the Fireware Foundation in collaboration with the Forum and others and more and more, it's also enlarging. Data models are also now available as you find them in GitHub. You see there the link, but you will also find things uh, in the, the Fireware website. So, and it's it's not just what smart agri-food, all the say different domains are there. There are synergies and collaboration. On top of that, and I've put here some links and we did quite some projects in the most recent year, just the Internet of Food and Farm 2020 project and the Smart Agri-Hubs project uh, realized over 80 use cases over the thumb, 80 use cases of applying technology and quite uh, some with using fireware technologies. And also, uh, if you see, if you're looking at the IoT catalog, which was more or less also populated with quite some uh, cases from the IOF project and also other projects, even from smart cities, manufacturing and so on, there you can also search for fiber technologies to have real cases. You can have also a look at stakeholders which, which did that work and can learn from them. Um, therefore, concluding my presentation, well, to highlight again, fiber offers both open source software components that we have the functionality as well as a collection of data models for different domains. So talking about data and functionality, and at the same time, not reinventing the wheel, being open, being, let's say, inviting everybody to join us and also in the mission support committee. So it's not a cl club of individuals, it's really open for, for Fiverr members that you're joining us and uh, that we're really trying to, to have here a critical mass and facilitate the work on smart solutions in Arif. And uh, yeah, definitely facilitating interoperability and replicability of smart solutions. There are many other projects out there, like in the moment, the Demeter project, the Atlas project here from European perspectives, and also many others, uh, which 
I have a lot of takeaways and what we are even doing in the Smart Agri Hubs project nowadays also to have there a forum, a portal just to exchange experience on, on work, what we are using, not just fireware, also many other uh, topics. Uh, therefore, we also aim at cross-domain collaboration, not just agri-food, but even beyond that. But we also know even in agri-food, if we're talking about arable, dairy, meat, fruit, vegetables, each even sector has its own challenges and its own standards and so on. Even there, we have uh, enough challenges. Therefore, we think the work which is done also in fiber as a baseline for an innovative use of data spaces. And we must not forget fiber is open for all forever. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Harald, and uh, I renew the uh, invite to all of you to join the uh, Mission Support Committee because uh, we want to work all together on these topics. And uh, now it's time for Dr. Francisco de la Vega, CTO of FICOTS. He is uh, a fiber architect and uh, he will discuss about uh, some use cases uh, from uh, IOF 2020. Thank you. Uh, you have 10 minutes from now. Okay. Well, um, thank you all for attending. As uh, I'm Francisco de la Vega, CTO from FICOTS. Um, um, maybe you don't know us. We FICOTS are members of the Fiber Foundation. And we are uh, in charge of two different components. One is the business API ecosystem for the monetization and other is workload for the creation of uh, dashboards in general. And we participate in this IOF 2020 project in charge of the topic I'm discussing now, which is the data marketplace. Well, uh, as I mentioned, um, we are in charge of the business API ecosystem generic enabler. This component from Fiber is the one that we have used in order to create this iOS 2020 data marketplace. And it's basically a tool that supports the creation of digital marketplaces with the particularity that it allows you to monetize any kind of digital asset. It is powered by TM form APIs. So all the functionality uh, that is part of the business API ecosystem can be accessed using um, a standard um, TM form API. And it uh, main feature is that it supports, it gives you the tool to the management for the life cycle of the different product offers, which means uh, from creation of the product to monetization of the product, billing, customer payment, and also revenue sharing in case there are uh, multiple stakeholders involved. Uh, the main characteristic of the business API ecosystem generic enabler is that it's highly customizable. As I mentioned before, it is intended for the monetization of any kind of digital asset. But how is this rely in, in a real scenario? What uh, the business API ecosystem support is uh, the development and installation of different plugins. Each plugin uh, allows you to uh, provide the particularities for a specific asset type. For example, it is very different validating that a specific customer has permission to publish um, API service then an Android application is a, a valid AP key, are completely different. So that specific particularities are implemented as part of these extensions or these plugins that are installed in the business API ecosystem. On the other hand, you can customize the look and feel. You can create themes. You can provide branding. You can create new translations in case you need to use different locales and all these kind of things. And finally, you can choose which identity provider you want to use. The business API ecosystem is, in, in, is, is integrated with the Fiber VROC and the Fiber security framework in general. It is integrated with Keycloak from Red Hat. And in case you have a simple scenario where you don't need roles, organization, and these kind of things, and you only need to lock in the system, it is also integrated with GitHub. Uh, apart from this customization, the business API ecosystem supports multiple pricing schemas. Uh, it uh, uses three basic models. You can create one-time payments. You pay, you get the offer. Recurring payments, typical monthly subscription, or you pay per year on this kind of thing, and pay per use. You pay per call, pay per megabyte, etc. And it also has uh, some dynamic pricing features, which allows you to enrich this basic feature. For example, you can create an initial fee for a pay per use model, 
or you can create a 2% discount if the user makes more than 10,000 calls, this kind of advanced models. The business ecosystem is supporting uh, all the management of the product terms. So you can provide the license, you can provide the terms and conditions for your offer, etc. And you can also add service level agreement to the different products that you are, that you are including. Finally, the business IP ecosystem is supporting this uh, concept of revenue sharing, where the different providers can create revenue sharing models. These models establish how the income generated by a set of offers has to be distributed among uh, the different stakeholders that have been chosen by this provider. In case, for example, we have an aggregated offer with has data that comes from multiple sources on this kind of models, okay? Okay, so this is from the point of view of the um, uh, Fiverr generic enabler in general. But what uh, have we done uh, within IOF 2020? We have created the IOF 2020 data marketplace, which is a customized instance of the business API ecosystem uh, specialized in the monetization of data. Basically, we have providing, we have installed three, pl three plugins for the monetization of data. We can uh, publish the typical static data. You upload a file and with the data, someone buys and downloads the file, and also real-time data. It is possible to publish real-time data in both versions of NGSI, NGSI version 2 and NGSI LD. So um, this way data that is published in a context locker can be discovered, can be made available to third parties, and can be uh, bought with the objective that uh, all this data that is generated by the participants in the use cases from IOF 2020 will be able to get an extra income selling that data that is not critical for their uh, processes and, and these kind of things. Uh, of course, we have not just deployed the, the business API ecosystem. Uh, as we are using NGSI and we need to access uh, to control the access to this context broker instance, the business API ecosystem has been deployed as, as part of a complete framework framework. So it has been deployed jointly with the Fiverr security framework, which includes the Fiverr identity manager and the, and the PEP proxy, API umbrella, and also, of course, the context broker for hosting the data. And finally, we have deployed also a dashboard tool based on this component I have mentioned before called WarCloud for the creation of visualization dashboards on top of all this data that is monetized, okay? So this is from the point of view of the pure data marketplace, but we have done extra things with this instance that we have deployed. We have created something which is a data marketplace for standards. This data marketplace for standard is a joint task that we have made uh, between us, FICODES, the Wageningen uh, University and Research, and uh, following a couple of requirements that was uh, raised by Age Gateway. And basically what we are doing with this is turning the marketplace instance into a library of code lists, reference data, and uh, data models. So you have a single entry point where you can search and discover standards that come from different sources. In the instance that we have currently running, it is possible to discover agri models coming from the Fiverr data models, but also from Aga Gateway data model and also from GS1. So you can search there, you can look for those data models that best fit your need, and in case it's a URL data model, you can go to the website, or if it's a file code list, you can download it, etc. Okay, and well, uh, in addition to these uh, two instances of the marketplace, we made an extra integration, which is the integration with contract component. Um, uh, this task has been made uh, jointly by between us, FICODES, and ATB. Uh, CodeRack is uh, another component from the IOF 2020 project that uh, is now also an incubated generic enabler within the Fiverr ecosystem, and is basically a tool that allows to uh, control the access to uh, different services. If you have your API or your service, you can register it in CodeRack, you can provide all the API information, you can choose what users can access and these kind of things, and then you can download a small proxy Sorry, that can be deployed. Yes? Okay, that can be deployed uh, with your service and then um, users with an API key can access to the service using this proxy. With this integration, the business you can publish your offers in the business API ecosystem and those customers that buy your offer are going to be granted access within the code run system and are going to have automatic access to uh, the services secured with this contract tool. And just to finish, um, 
the, some useful links. The business API ecosystem software is part of Fiware, so it's fully open source and can be found in GitHub. And on the other hand, all the documentation on how to use it, how to customize, and how to develop extensions is in Read the Docs. We are providing Docker images for all this stuff. And of course, we as FICODES are providing services for customizing deployment and maintaining the instances. So this is all from my side. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm done. Thank you very much, Francisco. This is very interesting. And uh, we are passing through the value chain, uh, adding services, and uh, a way to collaborate with the, between different uh, stages uh, of the value chain. Now it's time for uh, Dr. Jason Fox, uh, our senior technical expert and evangelist in the Fiber Foundation that is very addicted to the uh, standards and uh, is working uh, to uh, an interesting uh, module that uh, we are also uh, collaborating to test uh, for the agri uh, agri uh, Gateway, uh, contractor gateway, and the uh, floor is still yours, uh, Jason. Okay, so you can see my screen and everything. Um, right. Okay, so let's talk about tractors. Uh, I'm going to be giving a, a very uh, short overview on the ISO XML IoT agent. Uh, and of course, uh, I've only got 10 minutes, so if we want to get in more depth afterwards, I'll be. Uh, uh, sitting the tables outside for the next session to work it out. So this is how to create an IoT agent for the ISO uh, 11783 protocol, which is for tractors and agricultural mach machinery. So what's that? Well, let's start uh, from the fact that you've got a fragmented uh, um, uh, um, environment here where you've got different different uh, uh, devices, di different uh, uh, machines who potentially are uh, talking different uh, uh, protocols, different things right down uh, in depth. So there is a already a unifying uh, a component called ADAPT, which is a C-sharp based framework to get interchange between your farm management system and the actual device itself, the MICS. Uh, and it's a conversion tool. It's a conversion tool written in C sharp, and it means that you can uh, say read information from I don't know a John Deere tractor and pay, and uh, uh, combine it with, uh, with information from elsewhere. Now, the one of these uh, um, uh, formats is called uh, ISO XML, which is kind of the uh, neutral uh, interchange, also sometimes called ISO bus. And it is uh, an, an XML-based uh, format for these these messages. So, so it's about uh, a 200-page specification from uh, ISO. You can pay uh, uh, 350 uh, euros to get hold of a copy. And the important thing here from this uh, this thing is that ADAPT can convert to ISO XML. ADAPT can convert from a multitude of different uh, um, equipment uh, uh, suppliers, so you can ensure that you can go from equipment supplier X to ISO XML. ISO XML, of course, as the name uh, suggests, is an XML-based format, and we want to get this into Fireware. There are actually two uh, um, separate uh, payloads here. There's also a binary messaging format, which uh, uh, I haven't had, you know, had time to look into more detail, but the uh, tra uh, transfer can go in two directions, so it's just like devices in Fireware. You can either push uh, information down to a uh, device, which in this case is probably going to be a USB stick, which you've got in the uh, machine itself, or you can also read the information from it saying the following task has been done. Here's a sample uh, ISO XML message. It's, uh, it's saying that the uh, um, uh, potatoes were, um, uh, were uh, sprayed with the following herbicide at a certain, uh, a certain date for uh, a customer called Napoleon the Pig of Animal Farm. Um, if you know the uh, um, syntax well enough, it is kind of readable, but it's not really uh, terribly human readable. It is very verbose uh, because it is a data uh, interchange format. You can have multiple uh, uh, baseline elements with each task. You can see there are multiple products there. You've got the potatoes, you've got the herbicides and what have you. And you potentially could have multiple workers or multiple customers or multiple whatever within the system, which uh, means that it's actually more complex to uh, try and read this information. This information which is coming in is effectively a multi-measure. 
basic architecture of how it would work is that you'd have the uh, device, the uh, 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 mobile information control system, MICS, which talks whatever, which would talk to a gateway. The gateway would then uh, be able to pass the, uh, or even parse the uh, um, uh, message so into uh, ISO XML message. Then you get the IT agent, which can just do one job. The IT agent is receiving uh, uh, ISO XML and it's pushing stuff to a context broker. Um, and vice versa, of course, you could get uh, messages coming down from the context broker, which would pass back to the gateway. Uh, the reason for this architecture is to avoid overloading the uh, uh, IT agent. IT agent is just taking in information in one format. Obviously, if you want to do something uh, cleverer, you could uh, I don't know, potentially uh, um, bundle up a load of messages in one go or whatever, but that would be the job of the gateway rather than the IT agent. Um, it, the IT agent for ISO XML, as the name suggests, it's an IoT agent. It's based on the, the same uh, um, functionality as the ultralight or the uh, uh, JSON uh, IoT agent. It only deals with HTTP trans transports. The simple reason that it's up to the gateway to decide how it's it's talking to the uh, uh, the outside world. So this is going to be uh, um, on the uh, on the cloud. You can just be able to, uh, uh, to talk with HTTP. It's got a north port and a south port, like any other IoT agent. Uh, and um, it's uh, uh, able to uh, uh, pass the measures as necessary. Um, this is how uh, a message is split up. You would start off with the, uh, this is taking a measure in, uh, you'd start off with a, uh, um, uh, a task, an ISO 1183 task, and you can see from that, here I've got a farm and two customers, and then these would need to be split within the IoT agent to become three uh, uh, entities in the context broker. I've got uh, Mr. Jones, the pod and the pig, and uh, uh, Animal Farm. Um, and you can see it's actually just a simple data translation thing. Each attribute can be taken out to say, OK, this is part of my uh, um, URM, my uh, NGIS ILD uh, person. This is part of my uh, um, uh, the element B is a name. And the name is part of my uh, um, my model. The in the interesting point here is that it's unknown at this point what which data models are actually being used. It's not trans transforming from a well known format to another well known format. It's transforming from ISO XML, well known, to whatever you're going to be taking into your uh, uh, your context broker. So it needs to be extendable and exp expandable so that you can change uh, the uh, um, the format as necessary. And of course, you also need to be able to maintain relationships. So in the case you've got here, you've got um, uh, um, the farm is owned by uh, Napoleon the pig, because he's taken over from Mr. Jones. Um, then you can see that that becomes an owner relationship. So you need to be able to understand how relationships work as well. Uh, the reverse also occurs, obviously, if you're going down, down from the uh, um, uh, um, context broker down to the uh, uh, devices, you can take a message, you can split it up into multiple uh, uh, entities so you can uh, uh, send uh, information to the, uh, the farm worker. How does it work? Well, um, a, we need to consider what the transport and the uh, message and the payload and protocol are, and it's very similar to um, ultralight. You just read in a message, ultralight, you read in a text message. You convert that into an in-memory object representation of the data. Obviously, uh, which, uh, the ultralight agents are, uh, sorry, the IT agents are node-based. Node is very much um, based around JavaScript. You need to have some sort of uh, JavaScript object. And then there are libraries which will just take an XML and just uh, put into some sort of bit of memory. You can then modify that into a usable amount of, uh, of data, which is then passed into the, the IT agent library, common, uh, common code. So it's an update for each device measure. So by this point, I've split the information into the uh, various different uh, um, tasks. And um, you then need to use a plugin to uh, align the measurements into an appropriate uh, uh, data model, which will depend on what you've supplied within your uh, 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 custom JavaScript. All of this is available online. You can see the link for the uh, uh, actual repository and the uh, uh, documentation. Um, 
Here's a, uh, an example payload. You just, just follow the uh, arrows round. So uh, we are um, um, putting in various uh, crops of wheat here, and you can see that um, the uh, XML uh, format becomes quite a, a, an array of uh, an object, which has also got a, a subarray. Obviously, each XML element can be embedded in another one, depending on the way that uh, ISO XML works. And you can see that there's a elements A and B for the actual idea of wheat, and then the, there's a, uh, a crop variant type, which is then an array. This is uh, obviously not necessarily how you want to place that directly in the context broker, but you need to be able to uh, uh, interpret this information. The information is then uh, uh, split into attributes, and as far as the attributes go directly into the uh, library, it's just the first level of stuff. So uh, A, in all cases, it is actually an ID, so that's not an attribute. That's actually uh, part of the uh, um, uh, entity. But B and the CVT goes into the uh, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, into the function where it is manipulated. If you manipulate the uh, uh, inf information, you need to be able to transform that that version into what looks like um, a proper um, um, uh, entity. And there is custom code which you can overwrite and you can change to say, okay, well, for the attribute um, CVT, I will call that a uh, crop variety oh, and I'll have a, uh, an array of relationships. Or uh, I will take the, uh, the weather. Yep. One minute. One minute. Um, there is a, uh, um, a function to uh, um, get hold of all this information as uh, to work out which bit of code you would actually go through. It's all based on having this... Uh, um, configuration for the uh, uh, ISO XML type. Um, provisioning is, as you would expect, uh, can be done just through a, uh, a config file. It is possible to do this through the uh, um, standard uh, configuration uh, stuff. And each, uh, as it's, uh, you can see from screen, each uh, message type, like customer, uh, aligns with an API key, which is the ISO XML uh, um, message type, and it, uh, any additional information, like the fact that you were uh, a, uh, a static data or whatever can also be uh, uh, added to this uh, system. Uh, there are uh, 52 message adapters which are there to be uh, modified as necessary, which will take A goes here, B goes here, C is deleted, and so on and so forth. And that is a very quick whistle stop tour to keep myself within time. So um, uh, please come and, uh, and, and talk at the tables more, and I can go on for hours about this. Okay? Thank you very much, Jason. And uh, now we are moving toward the end of our uh, session. Now uh, we call uh, to uh, speak to the Dr. Alessandro Giusti. He is uh, uh, working in a use case, uh, GRIST, next generation sensor supporting smart decision support systems for quality monitoring and farm to fork uh, systems. And uh, thank you, Dr. Alexander Giusti. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen also. Hopefully, you can see the presentation now. Um, so, um, thank you for the invitation in this uh, very interesting workshop. Uh, from my side, I will briefly present the, the GRACE project, which is uh, um, it, is a, it, it is an application related uh, to the agri-food domain, obviously, uh, in which we are also exploiting fireware uh, components. So um, the project is about developing next generation sensors supporting smart decision support systems for food quality and safety monitoring along the value chain, so from, from farm to fork. And um, yeah, very... Um, some brief facts about the project just as an introduction. So it's an H2020 project that started on the 1st of January this year and CIRIC is coordinating. Uh, CIRIC stands for Cyrus Research and Innovation Center and um, it's a 42 months long project. Uh, we are currently, as you, as you understand, in the first semester we are 
developing uh, specification requirements and conceptual design, so pretty much in the beginning of the project. Uh, it's a 5 million euros project with 14 partners from eight countries. You can see here on the um, in the, uh, on the map on the right, the, the geographical distribution of, uh, of our consortium and uh, the, the acronyms of the partners, the logos as well. Um, he, uh, I wanted to mention also that it is a project funded under the Sorry, call. I seven was the... We hear a lot of scattering now. Yes. Okay. Sorry, so, I think that there are okay, some... Line problems. We are um, uh, very briefly then, uh, also because of the connection issues. Let me just uh, explain what we are trying to address here with this Grace project. So we are focusing on fruits and vegetables uh, production chains, uh, so vegetables uh, food chains. Um, because of the problems related to microbiological and chemical contamination that occurs in such chains and is the leading cause of foodborne illness outbreaks. The problem with the with what is currently being done by the, by the industry is uh, examining contaminants in such value chains is done on random matches or random food samples. So it requires a lot of time and cost, and um, this often leads to a reduced check because it is possible, obviously, Sorry, to take a huge about, amount uh, of samples uh, with these procedures. So uh, there's obviously a risk for uh, for the society as well. Same, right? So w the Grace project is about addressing this need for faster microbiological and chemical contaminations along the food, the fruits and vegetables value chains. So um, the heart of the project is a new type of sensor. We're talking about hardware. It was a project funded under the photonics call. So we're talking about uh, technology of light. And we are developing this new type of sensor for simultaneously and quickly detecting different analytes of interest, different contaminants uh, for the fruits and vegetables value chains. Nevertheless, this sensor is part of a holistic modular solution that exploits uh, different engineering designs, Internet of Things concepts, and advanced data analytics in order to uh, support early detection of contamination along the value chain. So we're going to have two different versions of this graced instrument that is going to be developed. One is a graced Internet of Things node. So uh, this is designed to be used on the farm in a completely unattended way, like a, a thing in the Internet of Things uh, ecosystem. So basically collecting uh, quality measurements and safety measurements from the farm. While there will also be a, a graced instrument version, like a portable device that can be used along the value chain. So starting from the farm to the distribution, transformation industry, and uh, uh, even up to the sales points, a restaurant for uh, making controls just before uh, consumption of the, of the of the goods. So. Um, in terms Sorry, of uh, just one minute yeah. left, because then we are yes, close. yes. Okay, so just let me go to how the project links to to Fiverr to Fiverr uh, in this case. So, uh, as I said, the, even though the project is focused around the sensor development, there is also an important component that is the smart decision support system and the data analytics platform. And what is this platform? It's uh, it's a platform that implements a microservice architecture. Uh, where a context information broker allows sharing semantically reached information across different services. And you can see here on the slide uh, that uh, uh, on the bottom right, we have this gray box, which is basically a representation of our pilot. So this is where the gray devices will be used. And these are feeding with quality measurements uh, our context broker through the Draco and IoT agent components, which are also marked uh, with the blue color, as you can see there, as uh, fiber uh, components. And then this uh, data injection, which also includes data coming from other open data sources, can be fed to the context broker, which is basically, uh, again, an, a, a fiber component is based on fiber components uh, through the NGSILD. 
uh, which is a REST API that allows users to put the consume information to and from the broker. And uh, the broker itself, a broker itself uh, allows managing contextual information, storing and providing information and capabilities uh, to the smart DSS as Sorry, well. So, uh, I, yeah. I need to close because uh, time is tight. Sure. Sorry very much. But, uh, I understand it. It yeah. was a connection issue yeah, I know. from and my if side. If you want, and uh, together with the others, uh, we can rejoin in the virtual roundtable in the in air meet. You can find him. Uh, maybe Charlotte can guide you through the air meet to explain you. And by the way, you will find also in the chat uh, the link to join the mission support committee mailing list, so we can be in contact uh, for the future. And, Thanks to all the speakers. Uh, it has been a very interesting trip. It's just uh, a small trip of our big mission support committee. Let's uh, go on together. Thank you and uh, see you in the lunch. And thank you to you too, Andrea. Thank you very much. Have a great day.